Hello and welcome to this Learn Learn video on monitoring and control systems. In this video we'll be having a look at what they are, how they work, key terminology and some common examples that might come up in exams or assignments. Okay, so let's get going. Monitoring systems, first of all. Well, these are systems that just seek to observe the state of an environment through the use of sensors. The sensor reacts to the environment, produces an electrical signal, and that signal is then read by a microcontroller, which processes and outputs the data as required. So you have a sensor, and that reacts to the environment, which then produces a signal, an electrical signal, which is then passed to the microcontroller. The controller reads that signal, interprets it in some way, and then produces some data, which is then output in some manner. So for example, um, you have a, a heart rate monitor or an ECG. Uh, this is attached to maybe your finger or to your chest directly. And it has a sensor, and that could be a pressure sensor, or it could be some kind of electrical sensor. And that reacts, and it produces an electrical signal, which is then passed to the microcontroller. And then it processes that data, produces some kind of graph, as you can see here, the data for a graph. And then that is output in a graph format. It may also have some other uh, controls on there where, for instance, if it's, um, you know, if the heart rate goes above 180 or below 30, then it sets up some kind of visual or audio alarm or sends some, transmits some kind of signal to another device for, uh, in a different location in the hospital to alert the medical staff. So now let's have a look at some common sensor types and uses. So we've got a temperature sensor and they're used in weather stations to record the temperature. You've got sound sensors. They're used on your mobile phone. They're also used in burglar alarm systems. You've got light sensors, again, used in burglar alarms or in, for instance, infrared, passive infrared. They can be used in libraries where if you don't want the lights to be turned on when nobody's in the area, you can use an infrared sensor that detects and only turns on the lights when someone's in that area. You've got pressure sensors. They can be used on your mobile phone, for instance, on the screen to detect when it's been touched. You've got vibration sensors. They're very common in washing machines. If you load the washing machine wrong or you overload it, when it starts to spin, it can detect too many vibrations uh, or too violent vibrations and it will shut off the washing machine. You've got humidity sensors. They're really, really common in agriculture environments where you need to monitor and control the humidity within greenhouses and things like that to ensure that plants are getting optimal amounts of humidity, as are moisture sensors for the same reason. Moisture sensors are also found again in your mobile phone. So you might find sometimes when you, if you've got your phone wet and then you go to plug it in to charge it, it will pop up with a warning that says that the um it there's moisture been detected in the charge port and therefore you'll have to wait until it's dry gas sensors are really really common so methane sensors are very common in mines so if you have too much of a, of a build up of methane within a mine that can be dangerous so we'll have sensors and monitoring systems that look out for that also very very common in the home um, carbon monoxide sensors they detect carbon monoxide levels within a, usually a kitchen or somewhere where you've got a gas boiler. And if it reaches dangerous levels, then an alarm will be set off. Proximity sensors, they're really, really common in your car. So if, to help you when reversing. So as you're reversing, it will go beep, 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 beep as you get closer to the car behind you or the bollard so you don't hit those. And finally, we got accelerometers. These are really, really common in mobile phones. They detect changes of speed or direction within a device. So they've got a lot of different uses. Uh, very common in hard drives. So hard drives, because they've got a spinning platter. If you drop a hard drive or drop your laptop with a hard drive in it, you don't want the read head hitting the disk. And so an accelerometer is used to detect that sudden movement. And within the time of you dropping it, it will move the read head out of the way of the platter. So it won't damage it, hopefully. Now, there are two main distinctions of sensors. You have analog sensors and these output a analog signal. And they're usually much, much simpler. 
And these, in order to be used by the microcontroller, they must first be converted from analog to the digital, which is the job of the ADC. And there you go, and it looks just like that. So the analog signal is taken, it's output by the sensor, which hits the ADC, and then it converts it to digital. It is worthwhile noting that a lot of microcontrollers, especially the more complex ones, have the ADC on board, but it needs to be done either in between the sensor and the microcontroller, or it needs to be converted when it hits the microcontroller itself. And that is then goes on to the output. Did newer, generally more complex digital sensors, they have the ADC built into them. So a digital sensor will convert the analog signal to digital on the device itself, and a digital sensor will send that digital sen um, signal on to the microcontroller to be interpreted. So when it comes to outputting data from monitoring systems, it can be output in a number of different ways. So for instance, you could have a visual or audio output. So where with a heart rate monitor, it displayed it on the screen with a, a burglar alarm or with a fire alarm, it'll often just be an audio output. Uh, and then also you could have a vibration output. This is common on beepers or mobile phones. When you get a new message, it just vibrates. Uh, it could output to a hard copy. So especially in medical or within industrial environments, any data that comes through, they want to print it out so they can give that to somebody to interpret. Or quite common is that data is stored on a device. So if you have a weather station, it might just record the data as it's coming in, store it on the hard drive for someone later on to come along and pick up the hard drive if they're doing a long-term study. Or if it's in the middle of the ocean, then quite common what they'll do is that weather station every hour, it will then have an inbuilt satellite phone and it will satellite transmitter and it will transmit that data to satellites to be sent on to servers to handle it. Okay, so there's quite a lot of different options for outputting monitoring systems. So finally, let's have a look at some of the different common uses for monitoring systems in different environments. So we've already covered quite a few of these. Agriculture and farming, we're talking about pH monitors, humidity mod monitors, moisture level monitors, those kind of things. In medical, we're talking about blood pressure monitors and also chemical mo monitors. So monitoring things like blood sugar levels in the, in, in the bloodstream, those kind of things. Um, industrial and commercial with lots of different gas level monitors. So monitor monitoring methane, we're monitoring carbon monoxide, all those kind of things, depending on what the particular environment is. In the military, they use radar systems to, to monitor. And in office and domestic environments, we're talking about things like smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, burglar alarm systems, those kind of things. Okay, so that's monitoring systems. And now we're going to move on to control systems. So whereas monitoring systems only look to observe an environment, control systems actively, actively seek to maintain or change the state of an environment through the use of actuators. So how does it work? Well, we have the sensors just like previously, and that data needs to be converted from analog to digital. Uh, and that goes to the microcontroller. And this now, usually depending on the system, is compared to some kind of preset value. And the preset value is compared against the sensor value. And the result of that means that we either send a signal or we don't send the signal to the actuator, or we vary the signal that's being sent to the actuator. And then the actuator actually outputs, affects the output of the system. And we'll look at how it does that in a minute. Okay, so this is how the system works. Often what you have as well is you have a kind of feedback loop where after all this is done, then what happens is that output, the result of the output is then fed back into the system and the whole thing goes on in a cycle. That's known as a closed loop system because by having the feedback, you've closed this loop there. Okay, so that's a closed loop system. And let's have a look at this example of how a closed system would work. So let's say we had an automatic plant watering system 
where the idea was to maintain the moisture level in the soil. So you'd have a microcontroller that's checking everything. You'd have a sensor that's a moisture sensor. And all that would happen is it'd keep checking until the moisture level drops below a preset value that is the minimum value. Then the microcontroller would then send a signal to the actuator telling the actuator to turn the water pump on. And that would then turn the water pump on, which would, of course, then slowly increase the moisture level in the soil. This would carry on until the moisture level goes above that preset value, at which point the microcontroller would send another signal to the actuator saying to turn the water pump off. And doing that, that will create this feedback loop and this cycle that will just keep going continuously, aiming to maintain with a set level of moisture, an ideal moisture level. And in Python, you might, on a microcontroller like the microbit, you might write a bit of code a bit like this. So you'd set the minimum value of 700, whatever that is. And then all it would do is it just read the level, compare it to the minimum level, and it either turn the pump on or turn the pump off. And then we'd normally put some kind of sleep in there, either a second or a minute or an hour, even, I suppose, for watering plants, whatever your sleep time is. OK, so that's how the system would work. Now let's have a closer look at actuators, because these are the bits that are doing the important job. So the actuator is the component of the system that converts electrical signals into mechanical motion. OK, so it's receiving an electrical signal from the microcontroller and whatever that signal is, it, it converts that. Its job is to convert that into some kind of movement that affects the output of the system. So in the automatic plant watering system we looked previously, the actuator's job was to physically turn off or turn on a valve that allows water to flow or to stop. So now, it, depending on the type of actuator it is, it could be a simple on or off option, or more likely there will be some kind of analog option there where the signal it sends is how, you know, how much we're going to turn the valve on by, how much do we turn it off by. Um, that's, they're far more common because they allow more fine control and of a system. They can come in lots of different forms. Uh, they can be used to operate valves. They can be used to drive motors or conveyor belts, which are really, really common in factories. In fact, I've put a link there, and I'll put the link in the uh, description that links to a manufacturer of actuators, and they can show you all the different actuators, that, little animations of the actuators that they've got. And they can just be used, as I said before, simple switching of switches on or off if it's a digital actuators, actuator. Now, actuators are usually require analog signal, and therefore they need to have some kind of digital to analog conversion going on. That converter could be in between the, that and the microcontroller, or the microcontroller might be able to convert it itself, depending on how complex it is. Okay, so those are actuators. Those are the business ends. Now, finally, control system examples. Well, lots of different examples. For instance, in agriculture, automatic plant watering systems or any kind of climate control where you're controlling the, the humidity or the temperature within a system is really, really common in agriculture, especially in greenhouses. Um, medical systems, automatic insulin injectors. Um, so they monitor the blood sugar levels within a patient. And if the blood sugar falls below a certain level, it'll inject insulin. And automatic external defibrillators, that monitors the, uh, the signals from the heart and it, it can send the electrical shocks to restart the heart. Um, it does that. Well, actually, it's jobs to stop it. But anyway, uh, industrial and commercial, so fire control sprinklers. So whereas in uh, your home, in a domestic environment, if there's a fire, it might just set off a fire alarm and you go out of the house. Within an industrial environment, often it will automatically set off sprinkler systems or foam systems if it's in a, um, and, you know, in a, in a kind of aeronautical environment. It'll automatically set off foam or sprinklers or carbon monoxide to stop that fire.
missile systems, automatic missile defense systems. So rather than just having a radar that someone monitors, as soon as it's picked up on the red radar, it then sends out a, a missile to defend against that, such as the Israeli Iron Dome system. Uh, or on tanks, uh, turret leveling, automatic turret leveling. So as the tank's driving along, the turret actually levels itself rather than having to be done manually. Uh, office and domestic environments, air conditioning systems, it's automatically trying to control the temperature uh, as are heating systems and automatic lighting systems. So, for instance, either in an office or, you know, street lighting, it only turns on at night and turns on during day or when it's dark for some other reason like fog. OK. That's the end of the monitoring and control systems video. In another video, I'll be looking uh, deeper into the different types of control system and we'll be looking at open and closed loop control systems. As always, if you've got any questions or suggestions or requests for videos, please do leave a comment. And if you do like the video, please like and subscribe. Thank you very much.